Jonathan Kamara, let's get started as we move through May and we have a lot to cover. Okay, no time to waste. So let's move on to the Fed. Fed last week came in at 25 basis points, very predictable. Uh, but, you know, a couple things there, as Jerry was a little disheveled there at the mic, if I may say so. Uh, you know, he mentioned as well as some in the Treasury that uh, regional banking uh, sectors in good shape. There were some outliers, some idiosyncratic uh, mismanagement of risk there. But uh, very smart economists, smarter than this guy, uh, CFAs and all those kind of folks that are looking at going, mm -hmm, whispering by the graveyard, uh, because a lot of these banks out there have a lot of exposure. Not to mention we talked about the mortgage exposure coming due to the next couple of years, commercial mortgage, rather, uh, exposure. But just the asset liability matching and all these complex instruments and how that could come out wound, the way people withdraw money these days electronically in confluence with higher rates and competitiveness of uh, you know, money markets and we saw a large tech company, you know who, who's even offering uh, uh, pretty competitive rates. I, you know, I don't even know how you do that. I'm not sophisticated enough to know how you, you bank there. But beyond that, as far as what the Fed uh, didn't say, uh, they did not mention a pause. Okay, um, you know, they talked about evaluating the data after this la la uh, last raise, but no pause mentioned. Uh, and then, of course, they did not mention a pivot to lower rates. Everyone's expecting lower rates in the back half of the year in equity markets. In fact, some say the equity market has priced it in, but we did not hear that. Now, historically, if this was the last raise and we just glide through, the average is 108 days post in which you see then a, re a reversion or a pivot to lowering rates. But we don't really see that right now. Uh, we have stagflation. We have stubbornly high consumer uh, cost, stubbornly low unemployment rates, which we'll get to, uh, as well as uh, you know, a situation where we have zero growth. Welcome stagflation. Now, as far as the job markets go, last week uh, we had, what, 253 uh, uh, reported for April, I believe there, right? I believe, I know. I have it all memorized, but it is April, 253, trust me, with the 3.4% unemployment rate. But the market rallied after two ugly days, as usual when Jerry talks. Market gets, you know, what did he just say? <laughs> we don't know, uh, but we didn't like the tone. Uh, his tie wasn't on straight. But you saw Friday, the market jumped up. Well, the reason being, let me give you a little secret, is that March's employment numbers, which are again bloviated, were significantly reduced. The air came out of the balloon of whatever numbers they're reporting, as well as February as well, that you know, follows February. So we shall see. The number reported in April, probably gonna come down a little bit, right? We're, we're gonna probably have to pull the ripcord on that and uh, float down to what the real number is. So the market rallied on Friday. Now, that being said, don't be too gleeful, because a couple different things at, at work here. Uh, as far as the Fed is still looking at, after the last 10 hikes, seems like about 10 years ago, right? They started last year, 10 hikes, the raise at 5%. The Fed is still talking. Bullard, I think he's speaking again next Friday. <laughs> you know, and you know, really looking there at having, again, raise rates to keep inflation under control. And they do have some points. You know, some macro wins working against uh, you know, the recession uh, being upon us, which I kept talking about, we've seen signs of. But when you look at the dollar, it's been down this year, which has helped uh, you know, uh, quell the inflation. And then, of course, oil prices have been down as well, both of them. And they both could be moving higher for geopolitical reasons for oil and then the U.S. dollar on a reversion there, especially when you look versus the euro. Now, speaking of the euro, international stocks have been attractive this year because when, when the euro is weaker, actually help some of those large developed countries, and you've seen them rally, and we've had pieces in your strategies like sector and macro momentum and global macro tactical and as such, where we've had some of that foreign exposure as well as some emerging market exposure, especially like through Mexico and as such, where again, the weaker dollar helps those markets. Uh, again, some of those, that tailwind could be heading for you sailors out there into a headwind. So again, we're not going to be overly deployed anywhere uh, because these are macro trends. Driven. Now, as far as beyond that, when we start to look at uh, you know, where markets are right now, we have a little bit of a bifurcation, right? So if you look at the markets, Dow Jones, little, you know, you know, break even slightly lower there. S&P's up a few percentage points. So as you look at your returns, take this into account as well. If you took the S&P 500 and you did an a equal weighted across small, mid, and large cap, it is actually flat for the year. So of course you have some small and mid cap in your strategies based upon the way the factor analysis works. Although we are overweight large cap, take advantage of that weaker dollar, again, there is a mix in there. Now, that could be reverting as well, we'll see. A little alarming is, is that the Russell 2000, usually the beacon for a new bull market being strong, has been extremely weak. Okay, while well, large caps have been stronger, so you gotta keep an eye on that. Now, 
The, uh, the good news part of it is earnings season is almost gone. Everyone told us it was going to be awful, uh, but 85% have reported, 79% beat their EPS, 74% above uh, projected revenue estimates, but understand those were revised lower. <laughs> it's kind of like in school. If your mom was expecting a C and you got a C plus, was it really that great? Are you getting into Harvard? Do you want to get into Harvard? I don't know. But bottom line is, uh, is it is relative, so you got to keep that in mind as well. So as we look at markets, Friday market, for you technical analysts, I know, there, I know you're out there. I know you're out there. Uh, 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 held support at that uh, meaningful 50-day uh, moving average uh, across markets as well. So that is something uh, that was somewhat constructive as well. Now, the elephant in the room is May. Jonathan, sell in May and go away, right? Uh, a lot of the strategies have been fully deployed. Sector momentum just pulled some money off the table. However, historically over the last 10 years, the sell in May is almost sell after May because the last 10 years since 2013, uh, May has been about 4.9% average rate of return. In fact, only 15 slightly down in last year's ugly second quarter were the only down months, 80% up May since 2013. So it's more like sell at the end or after May. And with the debt ceiling, which I'm about to just get into, on the horizon, a lot of large money moving the chessboard there. And we shall see in your strategies as well that, again, if those winds start to blow, will start to take place across your uh, strategies as well. Speaking of the debt ceiling, let's get into the red meat media material. All the, you know, Treasury Secretary, all these people talking about, we pay our bills and we're going to default and we're go the raft's going over the waterfall. Well, let me just say, uh, if I may, they're kind of full of it. All right, so let's just talk about how it actually works. There's two types of defaults. There's actual default, where if the, uh, the uh, United States couldn't pay its principal payments, and even our worst enemies, uh, uh, their biggest hopes, know that that's just not going to be the case anytime soon. We're not going to miss principal payments. But there are technical defaults. Technical default is if you don't make a short-term interest payment. Now, that happened in a fateful day of uh, April of 1979. <laughs> I memorize that. So again, I wasn't dreaming of that. But April of 79, uh, you know, where again, some treasury holders actually missed some short-term interest payments. Could that happen? Is it possible? Yes. Unlikely. Because the pandering between both parties and the media and all that is like worldwide wrestling. And anyone who thinks wrestling's real, you can just stop the video here. So it's kind of like that. And we know in the end, uh, it's all going to work out like a 30-minute sitcom back in the 80s, right? <laughs> but we shall see because the volatility in the market, perfect time of year for that to happen, could occur. And your strategy, especially in your, your strategies that are more tactical, will certainly be sensitive to that. But as far as the debt ceiling itself, for those that are really worried, Trust me, when you look at the two different type of default levels, there is that thick layer of soil uh, against an actual default there either way. So with that being said, a lot of gray areas. Again, we follow the algos. We follow the large money, where money is flowing. We don't let our emotion or opinions affect what we're doing. And that is the beautiful thing about the platform. It's not perfect. But again, by being eternally vigilant and mobile and not being a sig sitting target for volatility in markets out there, that's the best place to be. So with nothing else that I think to say, or I could say more, but you probably had enough of me, I'm going to go. Again, Jonathan Camarda signing off. Stay frosty. Until next time, uh, let's just see what happens as the market turns. Take it easy.